Can't open this. Did you encrypt this with my key? It's not there is a there's the a scenario here, man in the I middle send, attack. I sent him a message right. as Kevin Brown and used my false key. Yeah. He then see, he then looks it up, sees that that key is signed. Where this could happen is a man in the middle attack. If you can get that onto a sufficient number of places, right. that people use it, and then you can intercept the mail that's coming to me and use the private key you created to decrypt that, you could. Or even if, if I wanted to sign messages and say, I am Kevin O'Brien, and I say the criminal is an asshole, or something like that, and I say, that is libelous and whatnot or whatnot. Right. That's the more likely place that you're going to be able to yeah. use a false key, is to claim when sending out your somebody. Right. But then well, you you know, then you would have to do a little bit of research saying, was that key actually from Kevin? Right. You know, right. we need to go and verify the but person it, but from it, Kevin. But, but it's a signed key. And I know, but it's not trust. actual. I, even though it has his yeah. name on it, it's yeah. not actually Kevin's. You would compare yeah. Kevin's right. key but to that. But Craig's example is. says he got people to sign it. Yeah. yeah, he got somebody to sign it. Then you look at the signature yeah, it's not, history of the uh, signatures perfect, that are on it. It's it's it matters who is signing that key. If yeah. he pretends to be Kevin O'Brien and gets his friend to sign it, and you don't know the friend or Kevin O'Brien, or you know Kevin O'Brien, you don't know the friend or the person pretending to be, you're not going to trust that key. Right. It's not a signing saying that you know this person is who they claim they are. It's that this key belongs to the person claiming to be this person. Right. Well, you could make it, I mean, if you want to come down to it, though, I could make a key that says I'm Kevin O'Brien. And then I could also make one for Tony and one for Mary and one for Craig. Yeah. And then have them sign the key I made for Tony. Now, I mean, for Kevin. So now it looks like Kevin's key is signed by Mary and Tony and Craig. Yeah. And people know them. Those other ones aren't also signed by anyone that matters. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you've got to be able to trust somebody in there. You have to make sure you've got some genuine yes. trustings yes. on one of the keys in the chain. Now, this is a good time to point out, because we're talking about trust, that there are different levels of trust. All right? So it's not a binary on-off, I trust you, I don't trust you. Uh, there are, you know, different levels. And, you know, a very high level, for instance, I, uh, I have Tony's key on my key ring. I have a high level of trust because I know Tony. And, you know, I can talk to him on the phone, I talk to him in person, we exchange email. It's pretty clear to me that the key that I have is really Tony's key because we use it. So I've signed at a very high level of trust. Uh, you know, if someone just says, hey, let's exchange keys, you know, I would have signed at a very low level of trust because it's, you know, you can, you how well do I know you? Key signing party, you'd be able to verify that you say who yeah. you are, but you can say it's a low level of trust. So let me flip this around now. Suppose I have a, some reputation as a reliable person and all that, and I do one of these guy walks up, you know, one of these key signings and said, let me, you know, exchange keys here. And I, okay, you know, you were at PangoCon, maybe you're technical and I'll trust you a little bit. Does that obligate me or, you know, put me in a position of, of worse uh, reputation or? You would make sure the person has their ID. You know, you want to verify yeah. that's the person who they say they are. So, like, I would, if somebody pull out their government ID or their driver's license, and I know that I can verify that's uh, authentic, then I would trust that they say, you know, that they who are, are who, like Craig, you know, I look at his driver's license and know yeah. that, you know, he's actually all you're, Yeah, all you're saying is that the person presented some piece of ID, and that ID, you're saying that that ID and that key go together. Yeah. Okay, but that, I'm saying further on though. Now, is there anything that, like, it, yes, might it, harm my reputation because yes, that if person you are willing to sign other people's keys without checking that match, and it becomes known. And and I would think the level of trust you put on it, um, if, if you did something like that with someone you just met at a key signing party and said, oh, I have ultimate trust in this. And that, yeah. That's kind of stupid, really. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yes, I mean, if you do stuff like that, I, I think your reputation could take yeah. a hit, and deservedly so. Yeah. And real CAs have taken hits yeah. for, for just that, where it became known. One of them started handing out Microsoft certs. Yeah. Non-Microsoft employees. 
Yeah. And real quickly, their cert disappeared out of almost and all of the web a, a cert authority just had to cancel like 140,000 of their certs because it got compromised. Jeff? So in general, the, what, the uh, trust level is more indication that, that the person is who they say they are, but rather they don't sign keys stupidly. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think that, that that's probably fair. And I mean, I know, you know, I got family members who I trust who their identity is, but I certainly wouldn't trust them to sign anybody else's key because they're idiots. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. right. So right. if I looked at a key and it was signed by Matt, it's like, well, all right. <laughs> so there's also, there's plugins for your web browsers, or for your mail clients. Yeah. Evolution has one built in, you know, as soon as you install it, it's ready to go. You just have to give it your key ID. Mm -hmm. And you can start encrypting and encrypting. Uh, and there's K mail clause, Thunderbird, you know, my, it, they all have it available. It, yeah. just, it takes a little bit of work to get them installed and get going. This Gmail? Yes. Uh, yes. It's called Mail Below. And it's a, uh, it's a Chrome it's extension. Add -in extension. extension that, yeah. that you Firefox. install. Uh, and then you, you import know, your Firefox key. Too. In Firefox? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Evolution's good. This is the list of how to do it for K mail. For decryption for webmail, you're always going to have to have it in the browser or on your computer somewhere. You can't have the Gmail server decrypt your stuff. Right. Because then Google knows all your stuff. They have to have your key in order to decrypt your stuff. And that, that's part of the problem. I, people are working on and trying to find a way to securely do web email. And the problem is, as Ladar Levison found out, if you followed any of the legal problems he had, uh, he was the guy who put LavaBit together, which is what Edward Snowden was using. And the government uh, came and said, uh, we want all of your keys. And he refused. Now, if they had just said, we want Edward Snowden's key because he's a person of interest and we've got a subpoena signed by a judge, would have handed it over, but no, they wanted everything, which basically meant they wanted him out of, they wanted to take over his business. And, uh, you know, what that illustrates is that if the website has the key, you no longer control what's going on. Uh, and with that uh, mail envelope that you can use with Gmail, um, and I think you can use it with Yahoo Mail. Right, but it's a plugin in your browser. It's a browser plugin. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to have, yes, you import the key, um, assuming you've already had one created. You would, you would first export it from wherever you have it. You've got this ASCII file that has the data. Then you go into Mailvelope and you import the key. But you can create a key in Mailvelope too. Just what you if want. you haven't already done so, yes, you can create it that way. Um, and uh, you know, then at that point, it just basically it, it affects your compose window. You've got a little more stuff going on in the compose window than you had before. Uh, if you want to know how to do this, I've got a detailed explanation on my website. But uh, you know, that's how you do that. Now with Thunderbird, it's Enigmail. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Plasmail has a plugin you can do it. Yeah. Uh, Thunderbird Enigmail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's an app kit to get it installed on Linux. And then you go in and you, um, you configure it. So, um, you're talking about email. There's Even in my if you like, command line. There's actually two things you can do. Uh, one is encrypt and the other is sign. They're, they're slightly different. Um, signing is a way of verifying the authenticity of the email that it hasn't been tampered with in any way. Uh, that it legitimately came from you. And so that's encryption using your public key, so anyone can take a look at that. Uh, so it's not intended to provide any security at all. If you get a, a, a signed email, what you would see is the body of the email, whatever the message is, and then at the bottom you would see essentially base 64 is what it looks like. Um, that is the digital signature on there. If anyone were able to get in there and change the email in any way, you would 
it would show up when someone took a look at the, at the key. Um, so when it got to your mail, you would get a warning message saying, oh, you know, this, this digital key, this digital signature doesn't seem to go with this email somehow. And if you just change one letter, that would happen. Uh, so it's very good for, uh, the technical term is non-repudiation. All right, if I've got my key on there, I can never say later on, oh, that, that email wasn't for me, what do you mean? <laughs> because it's got my key. Uh, now, encryption is different. Encryption is when I send the email, and, and at this point now we're back to saying, who am I sending it to? I can only send encrypted email to someone for whom I have their public key. Already on my key ring. And then I can say, well, I want to send. So I've got Tony on my key ring. I can send Tony an encrypted message at any point. Um, I don't have Matt on my key ring. So if I wanted to send Matt an encrypted message, I'd have to you know, find out, hey, Matt, what's your, uh, what's your key? import that onto my key ring that I could send him the encrypted message. And in that case, the entire message looks like something out of that's base 64 encoded. This the references I got stuff from the um, you know Facebook Wikipedia and Ubuntu and uh, there's actually this is a really good uh, in, in Introduction and info on PGP. The, it's L. It's log do. I think it's. Uh, I can't remember where it's from. Okay. Uh, but anyway, here's me. Um, oh, I created this presentation in it, it, with Impress.js. This is the editor I used. It's a web-based editor. I just thought it was kind of cool. Uh, this presentation is going to be out on YouTube, and we'll send a link out. And yeah, my Google Hangout dropped, so we won't be able to get it off of that. But we'll get a, a one up of what gets uh, creating. Then I'll have the audio also. Sir, you had a question. Uh, what about revocation keys? Oh you, yeah. In case you lose your passphrase, you lose your private, you get stolen. That's yeah, yeah. that's tough. Because if you don't that's, have your passphrase, if you don't have your, your passphrase, you're host. You create one at the beginning and store it in a backup or locally just in case before sending it to the The way a revocation key works, uh, you, in, in fact, most, uh, most of the processes for creating a key will prompt you to create a revocation key at the same time. Uh, and what <coughs> happens is we talked about key servers, and, and your public key is available out on all of these key servers. So. If I told you, you know, here's my eight-digit fingerprint, um, you know, you could go look that up and start sending me stuff. Well, what happens if my key gets compromised in some way? Uh, someone got a hold of my private key and I hadn't protected it very well and I don't trust it anymore. Uh, a revocation certificate allows you to mark it as revoked. It doesn't make it go away, it just adds an indication on the site that this shouldn't be trusted anymore. So how about key management, just one step further? I mean, so you're, you're backing up your key, that's a good thing to do. You're keeping track of what your passphrase was. Mm -hmm. you're, are you setting up uh, expiration dates for keys? Are you doing multiple keys of yours? You have an option. Uh, and. You know, what I often tell people is if you're just doing this for the first time and you're just kind of playing around with it, uh, set up a key that's going to expire, you know, in a month or a year, something like that. Because if you decide, oh, that isn't really the way I wanted to do it, it's, it's not a big deal. Um, and you can set that at the time you create the key. That's one of the things you're prompted for is how, how long it will live. If you don't specify anything at all, it is permanent. Uh, and then the only way to get rid of it is to use your revocation key. And again, that's one of those things you have to know your passphrase to do it. Say you set an expiration date. Yeah. 
and then you've published the public key on the key servers. Mm -hmm. At the time of the expiration date, does it go away? Is it no longer available on the key server? I'm not certain. I would think they might just mark it as no longer valid. Right. But uh, I don't know. Interestingly enough, exactly the same issue is happening now on certificates for websites as a result of Heartbeat. Well, so everyone should be fixed now. If it's not, if your server isn't fixed now, you got a yeah, real problem. Yeah, but, <laughs> but no, no. The problem is, what if someone already got the key to your certificate and uh, can start? Yeah, the, well, fixed, but then recertified. You should have put so a your old certificate should be revoked, right. and you should get a new one. Not everyone is doing that. A lot of places are just well, we'll get a new certificate, and they don't bother with revoking. We're starting to discover that well, there's a mechanism in place for revoking. But how well does it work? Do all of the browsers actually pay attention to this? <laughs> you know, we rekeyed it work with. I don't know if we revoked the old one. <laughs> <laughs> you should. And, and if you're interested in that, uh, Steve Gibson at Security Now just did a very detailed uh, look at the revocation process and what the issues are. It was just a couple of days ago that went out on that feed. And by the way, this is. Uh, the seahorse, um, the GUI for keys. And these are the different keys I have in my key ring. Um, I'm not connected to the Wi Fi at the moment. Let me see. Uh, yeah, that key for me is no good. Okay. <laughs> that one? Yeah. Anyway, Sue. So, I don't know if I'm going to connect here. I'm seeing multiple email addresses per key, but look at it. That's just the right. or? Well, this is what I was saying before, that uh, if you use one key for all your email addresses, um, they're going to show up in the key, and then that would, you know, and if you don't care, I mean, I have like nine or ten email addresses. Am I the only one who does that? I've got several. No. Right here. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see there's... It's it's common that people will do it. It's just whether you care if other people see all your email yeah, addresses together in one spot. I mean, it, it's not the worst thing in the world, but you know, maybe you don't want all of your email addresses out there. Or some of them have to do with associations. I that like, you I like the way Ben Yurt there tells you which key's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you could do a single key for each email address if you wanted to. You oh, could. could. And if, if that's a concern, then that would be the recommended way to do it. I don't know if it's going to let me connect in. I wanted to show you a phone call. Oh, you really broke it. <clears throat> yeah. You broke the interwebs. You broke that. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we're yeah, we're just not. about out of yeah, time. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to work. Um, so, if, if there was one more question, we could fit it in. Jeff? Um, I know I started to use the Ubuntu key server. There's a, isn't there a pool? The key pool that you can uh, put in place of that that picks out a server that actually works? A lot of times Ubuntu doesn't even respond. Where's George? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, MIT, I think, is uh, pretty reliable. Well, there's an actual pool, right? Yeah. So yeah. And, but, yeah. Right, and you can say use the pool, and then it just, whatever <laughs> think, server responds first. Mm -hmm. You can, yeah, in the configuration, you can tell what server to use. Or, but, uh, so this one searches all the servers. Uh, you have a but so like a pool. for, for as it's sending your keys, publishing them? Right. I'm not sure. Okay. It should, still, it should still work. Yeah. yeah, as long as you found one that does work well, then it's going to be distributed out. Okay, I think we are done. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you.